To talk about the Holocaust, I unfortunately have to begin by talking about Adolf Hitler and Nazism. Adolf Hitler came to power in January of 1933. It's very important for us as Americans to realize that Hitler came to power through the electoral process. He was the head of the largest party in Germany. The Nazi party gained 35 to 37 percent of the vote in the elections of 1932, and in a multi-party system that made Adolf Hitler eligible to be Chancellor of Germany. Hitler assumed the chancellorship at the end of January 1933, and he began his first assault against Jews on April 1st, 1933. Legislation was introduced to place only Aryans in the civil service, and all non-Aryans were dismissed. A non-Aryan was defined as anyone who had one Jewish grandparent. The Nazis were not just chauvinists or nationalists, but had a vision of the world in which their orientation, Aryanism, was dominant. They saw Aryans as the elite of the world for whom there were no boundaries, or no obstacles in terms of their need to conquer and to rule everyone on the basis of their racial superiority. The Nazis identified an enemy they called the destroyers and that was the Jews. Why were Jews the destroyers? Because the Jews were ultimately opposed to everything that elitism and racism calls for. Jews emphasized individualism. Jews stood behind political movements such as liberalism. Jews were interested in equality and democracy. From the very beginning, Hitler saw the conflict as one between Aryan creators and Jewish destroyers. In 1935, the Nazis decided non-Aryans could not be German citizens. The Jews then were separated legally and civilly from society. Jews were excluded from the economic sphere of Germany too. Jewish assets were first registered, then seized by the Nazis. Jewish businesses were given to Aryans, and Jews were dismissed from jobs. In 1935, they passed legislation called Laws for the Protection of German Blood and Honor. Protection of German Blood and Honor meant that non-Aryans, again, Jews, could not marry Aryans. They could not even cohabit with Aryans. And they could not even hire as servants in their homes or as employees. Aryan women under the age of 45 for fear that they would seduce them sexually and therefore pollute them. The very first physical assault against Jews in Germany occurred in 1938. Uh, this is the evening of November 9th, 1938, called Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, when in response to the assassination of a German diplomatic official in France, a huge massive assault against Jewish institutions, Jewish businesses, and individual Jews took place in Germany. Jewish property was destroyed, Jewish synagogues were firebombed, large numbers of people, perhaps as many as 20,000, were arrested on the night of November 9th, 10th, 1938. This marks an escalation in Nazi policies of assault against Jews. What did the Nazis want? The answer is very simple. They want to get the Jews out. OUT becomes a solution to the Jewish question. Get them out of the economy, get them out of the society, and if possible, hopefully, get them out of the country. The problem is that in the 1930s, the world is suffering from the Depression. And to leave Germany, you have to leave behind all of your assets. No country wanted to take in penniless immigrants, including the United States, which didn't even absorb the mandated number of refugees according to our own quota system. Meanwhile, Germany is expanding. In 1938, in violation of the Treaty of Versailles, Germany absorbs Austria. That brought a new problem. So statistically, about 150,000 Jews managed to leave Germany between 1933 and 1938. And within one weekend, the annexation of Austria brought 175,000 Jews into Germany. So the policy of OUT wasn't working. So the Germans stepped up the policy of Jewish emigration, rounding up Jews in Germany, putting them on buses, putting them on boats, and just physically pushing them out of the country. In the summer of 1938, the Jews became the boat people of Europe. The situation became quite desperate. Then on September 1st, 1939, the Germans invaded Poland. As part of the Nazi effort to move to the east or to acquire that necessary living space, that it needed in order to serve its function, its self-declared function, as protector of European culture and civilization against the hordes of Asiatic uh, Soviet Russia. Poland was home to three million Jews. 
Jews made up about 10% of the Polish population in the interwar period. Jews were also very much a part of Polish life and scattered throughout the country. The Germans divided Poland into three sectors. The western part went to Germany with its half a million Jews. The central part of the country was also ruled by Germany and it had a population of a million and a half Jews. And the eastern sector went to the Soviet Union. There were another million Jews there. In order to make the war against Poland, Germany negotiated a neutrality pact with the USSR in late August 1939, thereby neutralizing the Soviet Union and not fearing Soviet forces coming to the aid of Poles. The payoff for the neutrality pact was that the Soviet Union was able to expand into eastern Poland. It's at this point that the Germans decided that they really had to pursue this theme of ethnic cleansing that they initiated in Austria in 1938. And they began systematically to round up Jews from the western part in order to deport them. In 1940, the operating principle, as far as German policymakers was concerned, that they were going to round up all the Jews of Europe, all the Jews that were under their control, perhaps as many as four million Jews, put them on boats and send them to the island of Madagascar off the coast of Africa. This would get the Jews out of Germany's hair and onto an island far away. While waiting, the Jews were herded into enclosed areas, ghettos. Conditions there soon deteriorated because the Germans had no reason to waste food, fuel and medicines on the Jews. Everything was rationed and people died by the thousands. The next phase in the Nazi assault began in 1941. Hitler, against the better judgment of his generals, decided he really had to go to war against the Soviet Union. Nazis saw Bolshevism and the Soviet Union as the home of international world Jewry. Hitler began a military campaign against the Soviet Union in June 1941. He knew that his army couldn't endure the harsh Russian winter. Supply lines would be disrupted and the Soviets would gain the upper hand. He knew they'd have to move fast. In order to protect the military, the Germans established a group of 3,000 killers, special units, Einsatzgruppe, whose job it was to follow the German troops close behind and systematically to kill, murder, all of those people that were presumed to be in a position to organize resistance because the German army just didn't have enough time to pacify the regions. The Einsatzgruppen targeted all Bolshevik officers, military, political officers, town mayors, officials, and Jews. The invasion began June 21, 1941. In the first phase, in the first months, male Jews between the ages of 15 and 55 were targeted. But by the middle of the summer, that group was expanded to include women and children as well. We now have the first step in the final solution of the Jewish question. It was no longer going to be a case of getting the Jews out. It was going to be the destruction of the Jews. Then the decision was made to not only target the Jews of the Soviet Union, but all the Jews of Europe. That means the middle-class Jews of France, that means the Jewish burghers living in the Netherlands, that means the Jews of Belgium, the Jews of Holland, the Jews of Western Europe, the Jews of Southern Europe. They went as far as Greece. But here was then the final solution. Jews are going to be rounded up and sent to special killing centers in Poland that were established in the course of late 1941, early 1942. And by the summer of 1942, that process was in full swing. Auschwitz in Poland becomes the principal killing center serving non-Polish Jews, with killing centers elsewhere in Poland destined for the three million Jews there directly under Nazi control. By the end of 1944, the last remaining Jewish community in existence was the Jew, were the Jews of Hungary. Hungary was an ally of the Germans. The Hungarians did not turn the Jews of Hungary over to the Germans until March of 1944 when the Germans invaded Hungary, their ally. Over the course of the summer of 1944, 400,000 Hungarian Jews were rounded up, deported, and executed at Auschwitz. Even though by that time the West knew what was going on at Auschwitz, nothing was done to stop the killing. As late as July 1944, one month after D-Day, the Nazis were still sending Jews from France to Auschwitz. The Nazi commitment to the destruction of the Jews was total. This was a war they intended to win, and almost did win.
it gave us the courage in to, first of all, live for the other person. I knew I have to stick it out because I have to have my dad with me. And, and that's what kept me going. Sam Gottesman survived the Holocaust with his father Isaac. Their love for each other helped them endure starvation and sickness, years of slave labor, and two of the most horrific concentration camps, Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen. I was born in the Carpathian Mountain region, which was originally Czechoslovakia. We were a family of uh, seven children. We had uh, three brothers and four sisters, and mom and dad, of course. The Gottesman family was among the 1,500 Jews living in a little town called Irshava. The family owned a hardware store and lived a fairly uneventful life until 1938, when the Germans annexed Czechoslovakia. The Hungarians, members of the Axis powers along with Nazi Germany, took over the part of Czechoslovakia that included Irshava. That all came with Hitler's blessings, and Jews soon began to face restrictions. We had to apply for uh, permits to operate a business, and then of course they were all rejected. And so we had, legally, we had no way of making a living. Jewish businesses were confiscated and given to Hungarians to run. But somehow an underground market developed and the Jews of Urshava survived until March 1944 when the Germans turned against the Hungarians for holding secret peace negotiations with the Allies. It was a Friday night, I think, what first night, that German uh, soldiers came into town. Sunday morning, the uh, town crier went from places to places and announced that the Jews have to pack up a bundle for themselves and take only what they can carry with them. By noon, we are to report to the synagogue courtyard. They ordered us into a ghetto, and all those 1,500 families had to move in into those few houses. A week later, the Jews were ordered to the train station. They were sent to the nearby town of Munkac, a gathering point for the Jews of Czechoslovakia and Hungary. 30,000 people were crammed together. One day, everybody had to line up. A group of 80, 85, 90 people together, families together, five boroughs, and we all had to stand still. He came in, I remember seeing him with two young SS guards on the side of him, and he walked around us. I found out after the war, it was Eichmann himself. It was a chance encounter with Adolf Eichmann, the evil mastermind behind the deportation of Jews to ghettos and concentration camps through Nazi-occupied Europe. That particular day when he came in and looked it over, and that's when they started the first train to, loading the first train to Auschwitz. We got loaded in the, on those boxcars, family together, and of course we were crowded in there. We were given two buckets, a bucket of water and a bucket for your physical needs. As bad as that was, what came next was unimaginable. That's when hell broke loose. He opened up and it was SS, the helpers, the helpers were the Jewish boys, with the dogs clubbing, rouse, 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 don't touch anything, leave every day, rouse, 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 men separate, women separate, don't talk, don't ask any questions, don't keep in, you know, knocking us down. It was hell on earth. My mother and sisters were separated in the other line and don't see them anymore. 
And I was together with my father, at least that much. So we were trying to hold on to each other. Sam was prisoner number 37052. His father, 37051. They stayed in Auschwitz only two days before being picked to go to a slave labor camp in a little town near the Czech border. We were together up to about December of 1944. Sam hurt himself cutting lumber and was sent to another camp to recover. He thought he'd never see his dad again. He had problems with his legs, my dad. There were some boils coming out from starvation, I guess. And he asked the doctor to send him off to, to a hospital, which usually do, don't do that. For some reason, he was hoping to go somewhere. So he had no idea where I was. But he succeeded in, in convincing the doctor to send him off too. Where did they send Isaac Gottesman? Sam was in the new labor camp called Geister Giersdorf, in the hospital where they brought in new patients. And I was standing and watching them marching in. And here I take a look at my dad. <laughs> I just, you know, I gave up actually on my dad. I, I never thought that we will never get together again. Their relationship helped them remain human in an inhumane time, even when a bowl of soup could tear people apart. When we work, come home from work, first thing we were worried about is what are we going to get for supper tonight? This is very important. It's the first thing we wanted to know. Food was such an issue for the starving prisoners that they even planned when and where to stand in line to get their best food or the biggest portions. Sam loved the soup with biscuits. And I asked one of the fellows who were apart from the kitchen staff, I asked him, what do we have for tonight? He says, we have biscotten soup. I says, what? Biscotten soup. I just took my spoon and put it in, took a dip into it, and I started tasting it, and it was like cookies, melted cookies. I says, my God, I could not believe that this was what it is. And I, I just walked in to my barrack, slowly, slowly <laughs> tasting it. I dared not eat it all at one time. And I came into the room, and my dad was there, and, and we enjoyed every spoon of it. And then we came almost to the end, the end of it, and I said to myself, I have to get another bowl of this soup. Sam decided to pretend he fell and spilled his meal. He smeared a little of the precious soup on his clothes and went back near the kitchen. At the risk of a terrible beating, he asked for more, and amazingly, he received it. I turned around and I started walking to the uh, barbaric where my father is. And I started debating with me. This is where the, uh, the devil is uh, in it. I says, I have a bowl of soup. I'm hungry. I know my dad is hungry too, but he doesn't know I have it. So if I don't share with him, so what? He, he had his. And I kept on debating and debating. And I finally got into the barrack and uh, my father takes a look. And he just, his eyes popped open. He said, what happened? Where did you get that? So I just told him what happened. And he says, you, so you uh, risked your life for this bowl of soup? I says, I did it, that's all. And I did share the soup with my father. And this is, this is what you have to overcome when you have a, 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 a question or a questionable behavior that you have to solve right there and then. So I'm glad that uh, I was able to overcome my uh, desires and, and hunger and share it with my dad. And this is what gave us the courage to stay alive. We helped each other.
being a Jew is being in the resistance all your life because you were always a minority and you have to resist the trend, the outside trend, either to assimilate you, to convert you or to kill you. Moshe Baron faced death many times as a member of the resistance movement against the Nazis and their collaborators. There were hundreds of thousands of fighters known as partisans, people who fought mostly behind enemy lines. Moshe was one of the estimated 20,000 to 30,000 Jewish partisans. He fought the Nazis for over two years. I was born in uh, a shtetl in Belarus, then Poland, now it's a separate uh, independent country, in 1920. Uh, we were a family of uh, six, uh, myself and my brother and two, two twin sisters. Until 1939, we lived a quiet, normal, uh, without any big, uh, you know, aspirations, uh, life. All this has changed on September 17, 1939, when the Soviets invaded my hometown. Moshe's town was under Soviet rule for almost two years. At that time, Germany and the Soviets were allies and divided up Poland. But in June 1941, the Germans turned on their allies, the Soviets. In four or five days, coming from Eastern Prussia, they were in my hometown. Uh, they started issuing all kinds of restrictions of movement. For example, you were not allowed to use the sidewalks. You had to walk in the street. You had to wear the style of David front and back. And uh, around uh, November, I think December 1941, uh, there's a new decree. Uh, we have to evacuate our homes and move to an assigned area. The 1,500 Jews of Moshe's town of Horodok were crammed into a ghetto of less than 20 houses. Life soon became desperate. A group of young people like myself, I was at that time uh, 21, began to talk among us, what am I going to do? Uh, there were two suggestions, you know, you can escape, but where do you go? Or we are going to resist. Moshe, his brother Josh, and a few dozen young people were selected to work building the rail system for the Nazis. They left Hordok and soon met hundreds of Jews from nearby towns, also serving as slave laborers. The area, which was heavily forested and swamps, if not for that, I wouldn't be sitting here. And there was building up a uh, resistance. Russian soldiers who had escaped when the Nazis turned on them formed the backbone of the partisan resistance. They were soon joined by thousands of local people conquered by the Germans who wanted to fight back. There was a lot of weapons left by the Russian army when they, uh, they retreated, scattered. Some of them was collected by farmers. Some of them was found around. And there was a beginning of a resistance in the forest by minor skirmishes attacking uh, individual Germans or something like that. Moshe and some Jewish friends hatched a plan to steal some weapons and use them to join a partisan unit. The two of my friends from the ghetto worked in a neighboring uh, warehouse where the Germans collected captured Russian weapons. And they were sorting it out, whatever they were doing. When they told me that, I don't know who started, but we worked at a plan where they would carry out parts of those weapons into the yard. There was a pile of junk wrap it up, hide it. With help from a fellow prisoner, Moshe escaped from the ghetto. I'm in the forest now, and one morning, there are two Russian officers walking through the forest. Naturally, I stopped them, I speak Russian, and I introduced myself, and they told me they were sent to the front line to organize the resistance movement here, particularly training people in sabotage, you know, mining roads, attacking garrisons and things like that. And it turned out to be two Jewish officers. And I told them they would like to join the, the, the resistance movement. I had weapons hidden in the ghetto. Moshe was safe for the time being, and he learned most of his family was too. They fled Horodok and ended up in a different ghetto in the nearby village of Krasny. Finally, Moshe arranged with a sympathetic farmer named Kowalski to smuggle his family out where they could hide on a farm. He also arranged with Kowalski to get the weapons he and his friends had smuggled into the ghetto, out of the ghetto. It was arranged that I will meet him and the partisans in a certain village and they'll accept the weapons and accept me. 
but some non-Jewish partisans stole the weapons. Kowalski told him, They don't want to accept any Jews in the, uh, the partisans. So they took the weapons and they gave it to the locals, whom they knew. Without weapons, the Jewish boys couldn't join the partisans. And all around Moshe, things were getting worse. In July 1942, the Nazis murdered the last remaining Jews of Horada, rounding them up into a barn, machine gunning them, and then setting the barn on fire. And the Jews of Krasny were all killed in March 1943. I finally joined the, the, the partisans. Uh, I was attached to a certain group. Uh, in the beginning, in 1942, we were a small group uh, doing very little, just trying to survive ourselves, you know. Some people would go out on the uh, operation and raid a farm, just take whatever we could for ourselves. We built bunkers in the forest, you know, it's plenty of wood. For the winter, it's a Russian winter, it's 20 degrees below zero. In July 43, the Germans started harassing our, our groups throughout the whole territory because we were disrupting their supplies to the front line. We were mining roads, we were ambushing their uh, convoys on the highways, um, blowing up trains, and they had trouble supplying the fronts. They couldn't supply and they couldn't protect their back. And if they were retreating, we were, we were menace, menacing them too. So. When we knew that they are after us, we would retreat. In 1944, the Russian army closed in on the Germans, forcing their retreat. It was the beginning of the end of Moshe's nightmare. One day, we hear noise on the, uh, on the highway. Uh, here they are, the Soviet tanks and trucks and planes moving west. So you were free. Uh, I, we couldn't return to my hometown because my town, hometown was destroyed by our own people who came back. Uh, they took care of the collaborators and the head of the city hall, the mayor, and they burned the town. But Moshe was luckier than most. His mother, brother, and one of his twin sisters survived the war. The family reunited and after a difficult journey came to the United States and Moshe and his sister Minna settled in Pittsburgh. Why did I join the resistance? I wanted to, to leave. <laughs> I, I knew what was coming. In May of 1939, when I was 14, we got permission to come to the United States. Had we not gotten out just in time, uh, or had we been rejected again by the consul, by the American consul, we would have been in that position of being sent to death camps. And of course, like most uh, uh, people who were sent to the death camp, would have been killed. Fritz Ottenheimer, his parents and sister Elsa were very lucky. They got out of Constance, Germany just in time. But six years later, Fritz returned, this time to help fight the Nazis. Well, I was eight years old when Hitler came to power. It didn't take long before I realized that this was a very drastic change that uh, wasn't just for the adults, it wasn't just uh, something political. It affected every one of us, uh, even the kids, uh, because the tremendous amount of propaganda, hateful speeches, and uh, then the restrictions came, all kinds of laws, cutting down on what we could do. Though restrictive laws soon were in place, the people of Constance weren't hostile to the 500 Jews who lived there. Some 200 or 300 people immigrated to Constance from other parts of Germany that were more vicious. Uh, they heard that Constance was a better town. Jews fleeing the Nazi regime from other cities soon started pouring into Constance. The city is on the Swiss border and Switzerland offered safe haven. Fritz's dad helped one family cross a small creek into Switzerland. 
Well, they must have called their relatives and friends immediately. And soon we had a stream of people coming through our house, to our house for the purpose of being smuggled into Switzerland. Fritz's dad was joined by a sympathetic local police officer who felt the Nazi persecution of the Jews was wrong. They helped between 200 and 300 people escape into Switzerland, but then things went wrong for the Ottenheimers. People uh, stopped coming to our store. Without customers, you can't run a store very long. So we had to give up our store very early after the Nazis came to power. Then in 1938 came Kristallnacht. That was really the first nationally organized violence in Germany. There was no doubt after that that we had to get out. Constance had an SS squad. Constance had the Gestapo, the secret police. Constance had a fanatical uh, Nazi mayor. But the population generally didn't participate much except waving flags and things like that. When Kristallnacht came, the SS squad blew up the synagogue with explosives. The uh, Gestapo uh, arrested all the Jewish men above age 16 and uh, transported them to Dachau concentration camp. Fritz's dad was one of those arrested. They held him in Dachau for a month before he was released. It was just in time because if they'd kept him another week or so, I don't think he would have survived. So uh, he came back and uh, we were waiting, waiting, waiting. Finally, in May of 1939, when I was 14, we got permission to come to the United States. Fritz went through high school, excelling as a student, and then was eligible to be drafted. I was accepted into the United States Army on the condition that I sign a waiver. Because I was not a citizen of the United States, I could not be forced to serve in the Army of the United States. I did not enjoy the idea of joining this uh, uh, tremendous conflict at the same time, my feeling was that I had a much better reason for fighting against my fatherland than all the other uh, recruits had. All they knew about Nazi Germany was what they read in the newspapers. I had the personal experience of the uh, persecution. Trained as a sharpshooter, Fritz soon was given a different job. Along came this other outfit, which was a artillery battalion that had been converted into a security guard. And they needed someone who could speak German. Then the war ended and the uh, rest of the uh, unit that I was with uh, was sent back to the United States for discharge because they were all long veterans of, of the fighting. I was transferred into military government uh, special branch, it was called, which was responsible for denazification. It was responsible for screening people who had applied or were applying for jobs in the German government, for jobs in the German police force, in the education uh, activity, trying to keep the old Nazis out of important jobs where they could get back into power. We had SS records, Gestapo records, very important. We had uh, uh, the personnel records of uh, war factories where people applied for employment and had to uh, prove their loyalty to the Nazi regime in order to get the job. And they made all these uh, statements of how much they loved Hitler and, and the government. And it was uh, signed and notarized. So we had wonderful evidence for people in that area. It gave me a lot of satisfaction 
to know that uh, I could uh, actually get back at some of these people for things that they had done. How could it happen? What is the lesson that we learned from studying the Holocaust? The most important lesson, I think, uh, that I came up with myself was there were 65 million Germans living in Germany when Hitler came to power. 65 million Germans did not become 65 million murderers. They became 65 million bystanders. I would like to tell people how it was when we were liberated. One of the SS men came and said, you are free. So here we were, first we started to cry a little bit, and then we, did, we, 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 had, we were hungry, we, were, we wanted to eat, because we just came out of concentration camp. Very few people survived the largest Nazi death camp, Auschwitz. Fewer still survived the monstrous medical experiments of Dr. Joseph Mengele. Esther Haas of Squirrel Hill survived them both. I was born in Holland, in The Hague, a beautiful city. Ricky, Rocky, Cla Claire, and Est Etty, they call me, no, not Esther. Esther was one of four daughters born to a well-to-do Dutch Jewish family. Two years after the German occupation of Holland, the Nazis started rounding up Jews to send them to concentration camps. When they came to get us, it was Thursday evening. I never forget that. And my mother says, go in the kitchen and make some cookies. So I did. And then they came in and they started to eat those cookies. I says, wait a minute. This we take with us. And they, they didn't touch it anymore. I was so mad at them. We knew we were going to go in a train. And from there, they brought us to Westerbork. It was a camp in Holland. Westerbork was a Nazi transit camp, a temporary holding area for people on their way to concentration camps in Germany and Poland. One of Westerbork's most famous prisoners was Anne Frank. They didn't have so many trains to, to bring the people to Auschwitz and, and, and other, other camps. So once a week, on Tuesday, they, they, they picked out old people and the people that could not walk too much, and they put them in the trains. Most of those people were gassed right away. Esther was kept at Westerbork for nine months, and during that time, her sister Ricky and Ricky's husband arrived. Esther remembers bargaining with a prison official in hopes of keeping them from being sent on to Auschwitz. I talked to the man who was in charge, a Jewish man. And about a month, he says, okay, I'm not going to send them, Ricky and her husband. Uh, she, she can stay here. And about four, we four weeks later, he says, um, she, she was very pretty. Uh, he said to me, I let her go, but only when she goes to bed with me. So I never told it to her. I never saw them again. Auschwitz. Right away when she came, they put her in the gas. Esther's turn came too. She was herded into a cattle car for Auschwitz. I'm sure we were scared. We were about three and a half days in the thing. There were no toilets, nothing. It was so terrible. Once at Auschwitz, there was the selection. Healthy men and women were separated from the elderly, sick and young. 
Overseeing many selections was the camp doctor, Joseph Mengele, who became known as the Angel of Death. He would point to the left meant forced labor, to the right, the gas chambers. Mengele was also looking for something else during the selection. Twins, young women, human specimens for bizarre medical experiments, like changing eye color by injecting dyes, attempts to alter the sex of children, sterilization of young women, all done without anesthesia. Some people got operations, some people got uh, just a, a shot, but we never knew why. Some people could not have children, and some people uh, could have children. We, we, we found out after the war. Mengele chose Esther as one of several hundred guinea pigs used for gynecological experiments. Uh, one time I was, went in, and that probably did a, a lot of not good things in my, in my, in, I don't know. They never told us what it was. Esther was held in block 10 where she found a group of friends. We had 10 girls. We stayed together wherever we went. I stayed mostly in the back because I, they needed me there for the sick people. And uh, sometimes I got so tired of it that one of the girls stayed and I could go in the fresh air. Esther and the other women were considered Mengele's property. From the Germans, he bought this. They needed money too. And that was maybe our help. Those girls also got a little bit more eating and also they slept in a bed. Uh, really one in a bed and stuff like that. And he came once in a while and he looked at everything and he said, he said they have it too good here. I remember he was very handsome. I didn't talk to him. He didn't talk to me. I was, I was a Jew. Being Mengele's property saved the girls from death more than once. They took us to the gas and um, and we knew what we, where we were going to go. They were going to go die. But there were always uh, people in our barracks. They said, no, no, they are the girls from Dr. Mangle. Twice they did it. The girls in Block 10 often lost hope. But Esther kept their spirits up, especially when they returned from Mengele's operating table. When somebody was bleeding, you couldn't do nothing. The only thing that you can do is give, give them fresh water a little bit and, uh, and, and staying a little bit and talk to them a little bit. There was nothing. Nothing but cold, hunger, and fear for the next two and a half years. But Esther remembers a strong will to hold on. Everybody wants to live and not to die. As the Allies closed in, Esther was again shipped out to another camp in Germany. Finally, the Americans arrived. You know, when, when we got free on my birthday, and the, the girls, the other night, they went to a restaurant and they asked for cookies and lemonade, and they got it, May 8th. 1945. Freedom, we had to get used to it. We cried a lot. We couldn't believe it that we were going to go home. Esther returned to Holland where she found a sister, Clara, who had survived the war, posing as a Christian. My father was 50 years old, 5 0. They killed him right away. My grandparents also, my uncles and my aunts. Everybody was gone. After the war, Esther went to Israel. While there, Esther married and had a baby girl. The child had birth defects and died at eight months old. Esther could have no more children. She blamed it on Mengele's experiments. Esther finally settled in Pittsburgh to be near Clara, her only living relative. I thought that I, I should be together with her. For many years, Esther would speak publicly about her Holocaust experiences, though it was very, very difficult 
to relive the past. I can't do it no more. I get, uh, now I'm, it is going to take a long time that I can sleep. And what happened to the evil Dr. Mengele? At the end of the war, he went into hiding. He fled to South America, where he was aided by Nazi sympathizers. But he was always on the run. He finally drowned in 1979 after he had a stroke while swimming. It was an easier death than that suffered by his victims. He was a mamza. You know what the mamza is. He was a bad man. At age 13, actually a couple of weeks before I had my birthday, I was coming home from a bar mitzvah lesson and found our home locked and no one there. San Weinreb wasn't even a teenager, yet on that terrible day in March 1941, when he returned to his empty home in Bratislava, Czechoslovakia, he had narrowly missed the Nazi roundup of the Jews in Bratislava who numbered nearly 15,000 people. They were expelled or sent to concentration camps where most perished. That afternoon was the last time I ever saw or spoke to any member of my family. Sam's neighbor and a kind stranger helped Sam escape into Hungary to be reunited with some family members. I had grandparents living there in a very small town and also an uncle who lived in Budapest, the capital of Hungary. He said to go to the town where my grandparents lived would be much too risky. And if I am caught there, not only I, but they too would be arrested for hiding a foreigner in their home. We decided to go to Budapest and located my uncle. I don't believe I will ever forget the look on his face when he saw me. He knew immediately that there was something wrong. Sam stayed with his uncle for just a few short weeks before one of the neighbors reported a foreigner living in the home. Sam was sent to live with a distant relative on the outskirts of the city. Once again, a neighbor informed the police that Sam was hiding there. I immediately got on the first streetcar back to the city. I had absolutely no idea where to go and what I was going to do. I knew that I could not get in touch with my uncle for fear that he would get in trouble. On the way to the city, I noticed a park and decided to get off and spend the night in that park. The next morning, I went into the city and started to look for some type of work. I stopped mostly at restaurants, offered to clean the place, wash dishes, and I told them that they would not have to pay me. All I really wanted was some food for the work I'd be doing. No one would hire me. The next five to six months, I lived outdoors on the streets of Budapest most of the time sleeping behind a factory that was closed at night. During the day, I had the difficult job of trying to get some food. And believe me, that was not easy. There were days when I succeeded, which wasn't very often. On the days when I could not get any food anywhere, I usually checked garbage cans behind restaurants, hoping to find some food in those garbage cans. Can you just imagine what it is like to be only 13 years old and not having a home to go to, not knowing where you will sleep each night, not knowing where you will get your food each day, not being able to speak the language of the country that you are in and be in constant fear. After almost six months, Sam decided he could no longer go on. He turned himself in to the Hungarian police. I thought, what could they possibly do to a 13-year-old kid whose only crime was he was born Jewish? How wrong I was to think that way. 
I did go to the police, told them everything about myself. I don't believe I finished that last sentence when I was slapped in my face by one of those officers and told there's only one place you're going to and that is straight to prison. I was put into a prison without even having a hearing where I spent the next two years. While in that prison, I worked indoors, cleaning the place, scrubbing floors, and whatever was asked of me. They used to call me forward, took me into another room, and then asked me questions, and at that time, I didn't even know what they were saying to me. I just, they spoke Hungarian to me. I had no idea what they were saying. And every time they slapped me in my face and kicked me and all that, I wound up on the floor, and while I was on the floor, they were kicking me, and every other word in Hungarian, you stinking Jew. After two years, Sam was released to his grandparents' custody. I had to report to that local police department twice every week. Sam was beaten every time he reported to the station. Then, a few months after his release, all the Jews in Hungary were picked up by the Nazis to be sent to concentration camps. The time was spring, 1944. The Germans entered Hungary, and all of us, all the Jewish people from that town were picked up and taken to a nearby city. It was like a ghetto. And we stayed there only just two, three days. And then we were all put on a train into cattle cars where we were sent to Auschwitz. There were soldiers with machine guns and dogs all over the place, making certain that no one escapes. Life there was unbearable. Auschwitz-Birkenau was the largest of all the Nazi camps in Europe. The complex included a concentration and labor camp, as well as a death camp. We got up every day very early. We, didn't, we had no watches. We didn't know what time it really was. But I know it had to be very, very early in the morning. And we received a cup of black coffee and a slice of bread. That was our breakfast. You know, then for lunch, we received, it was our big meal. We received a bowl of soup. And it consisted of maybe a little cabbage, potato peels, and whatever garbage they could put into that soup. But you know, when you were as hungry as we were during that time, even that tasted good. It wasn't just the hunger that the prisoners faced. After being in Auschwitz just a few days, we had some visitors that came to the barrack that I stayed in, and I will never forget that. It was one officer and two of his soldiers. And he began by saying, I want all of you to remember what I will be saying to you now. Auschwitz is a concentration camp where people will work or be sent to the gas chambers. If you're strong enough and are able to work, you may survive. If you're not able and cannot work, you'll be sent to the gas chambers. The choice is yours. Then this officer looked around and he asked two of the men to come forward. He said to them, I don't believe the two of you will be able to give us a good day's work, and shot both of them right on the spot. The only thing that kept me going was the hope that I, if I will survive and that I had to survive in order to see my family again. And Sam still keeps searching for the family he lost when he was just 13 years old. A couple of years ago, I got a letter from the State Museum in Birkenau with the records of my father, and they were accurate records. And I couldn't understand because they even gave me his name, where he was born, and how old he was, and they gave me the date of the, when he passed away, which was in July, 22nd, 1942. So that's the only record I ever got from my family. The rest of them I never heard anything about. My 
My name is Raymond Bartolo. I was born in Grove City in uh, May 19th, 1923. Uh, uh, and where I lived until uh, when I was about 19, then I volunteered to uh, join the Army. In 1943, Ray joined the 97th Infantry Division and was assigned to the Communications Center. His division was sent from the United States to Belgium, where they joined in the Battle of the Bulge. From there, the soldiers were sent down to southern Germany. I was uh, in charge of a wire crew where we laid the telephone wires to the front lines back to the infantry. During one of those uh, times, that's when we came upon this complex. There was a, a big gate there, and they also had uh, electric wire charged all around the camp in case you touched them while you was electrocuted. This is one of the gun tires. They had six of these around the prison camp. And this area here where this fence is, all that fence was highly uh, charged with electricity. There was about maybe three or four thousand people who was locked in the camp. And when the Germans knew that we were coming near an area like that, well, they usually took off. And we learned later that there was uh, like 12 or 13,000 hostages that was taken out of that camp and put on the forced march to another area. We didn't know what it was, and we learned out later that it was, a, we thought it was a prison camp. And, because we never heard of the word concentration camp or even the word Holocaust. Ray and his wire crew had wandered into the concentration camp in Germany, called Flossenburg. Between 1938, when the camp was established, and liberation in April 1945, more than 96,000 prisoners passed through Flossenburg. Many were political prisoners. About 30,000 died there. For more than an hour, the American soldiers wandered through the camp, the first people to arrive once the Nazis had fled. While we were there, we entered one of the barracks, and these, these heads all popped out of their bunks, and it was like a moment later or so that they recognized we were American soldiers. But they come tumbling out of their bunks, and they were screaming and yelling and hugging and kissing us and swarming all over us. And it was a sight that uh, just never been erased from my mind. They were sunken eyes and ashen faces, you know, and their eyes were sunken in. And uh, all of them were like dark complexed and just from malnutrition, I guess it is. And these pictures here are just the barracks of the camp. This camp held around 10 or 15,000 people. And what they did, they had them on 12-hour shifts where half of the camp would be out in the stone quarries or the aircraft factory there, and the other half would be in the barracks. We called back to our outfit to, you know, bring medics up and, and doctor and medics, people, and food. Uh, I remember we had K rations that we would give them, and, and as soon as they ate it right after a while, they just come right up because they weren't used to anything like that in their stomach. There was a Polish doctor in the camp that could speak uh, pretty good English, and he, he's the one that took us through the camp and explained to us what was going on in that. The Polish doctor showed the young soldiers the barracks, grounds, and the crematory. The crematory, this particular one where it was in the camp, they had six ovens. There was uh, three on the each side and three high. They wouldn't put any bodies in there unless they were all filled, you know, and then they cremated them. And uh, outside the crematory, they had a, what well, was it, a, a pit about six feet in diameter. And uh, the, it was almost filled up with ashes up to the top, the human ashes that would take from the crematory. They had this one area where it was a, a big pole, they call it the hanging pole, and they, anybody that escaped, well, they would have everybody come and, and they would beat the guys and hang them, and then take them down to the crematory and then cremate them. And they had the whole camp, maybe 10 or 15,000 people, 
Ray's extraordinary pictures of Flossenburg were taken by his company clerk in the days just after the American soldiers liberated the concentration camp. He's showing them to his grandson, Mike. And this was their main administration building that's still there. And uh, they have one of the barracks there. And uh, the guy took us through the camp. This particular picture here were these pile of shoes. When the prisoners were brought into this camp, they got to this area here and they had to take their shoes and throw them over the wall and they gave them wooden shoes. It made a lot of noise. So at nighttime, you know, if anybody was out, they could hear them clomp around. Ray and the other young American soldiers didn't realize the significance of their find, and he didn't learn more about Flossenburg until nearly 50 years later. It was like in 1995, it was the 50th anniversary at the end of the war. And everybody just sort of never talked about anything about the war. It was everything that they went through, all their experiences was sort of kept inside. These are uh, German uh, bayonets. Ray noticed an advertisement asking soldiers to tell their stories. He ended up becoming involved with the Holocaust Center in Pittsburgh, and he met a former concentration camp survivor from Flossenburg who lived in Pittsburgh. I find out uh, down here at the Pittsburgh Holocaust Center some of the survivors that were there and I got in contact with them. I met prisoners from this particular camp and one of them was, lived here in Pittsburgh and the squirrel here, his name was Mark Stern. And it was through him that I got most of all this information of what transpired. We a lot of times came down here or they'd call me and we'd come down we talked different schools, and he would talk as a survivor, and I talked as a liberator. We made a pretty good team for him, but I guess he passed away here three or four years ago, I guess, something like that. He was quite a guy. Why did the Germans have so much hatred against the Jews? Like, did the Jews do something? I always tell the kids, you know, I, I try to educate them in a certain way that they wouldn't have to ever experience uh, 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 an experience like that. And that, uh, the only thing I always stress to them is to always remember the, the, the peace that was won for you and the life you live in this country. At that time, we were only about 20 years old and we never realized the significance of what was happening. The, the concentration camp was something that just you never forgot about. I never expected every day to come back home alive. Every day I felt that's the last day of my life. From 1939 to 1945, Les Banos put his life on the line. At 16, he joined the Hungarian underground. Hungary had joined with Germany in the Axis in 1940. A few years later, he and his family hid hundreds of people facing deportation. And then Les joined the Nazi SS as a spy. He wrote about his experiences in the book, If They Catch You, You Will Die. In 1939, Way before the Germans came in, the Hungarian underground against the Nazis was forming. And they recruited me to work for the underground and put me in a factory. The factory employed about 35 to 40,000 people that did everything from dive bombers to tanks. And I was giving daily report what was going on there. I was born in Nirbator, Hungary, which was located near the Romanian and uh, Slovakian border, the small town. But I was educated and I lived in Budapest. My uncle, he was the head of the Steelworkers Union of Hungary, so he wasn't a Nazi. Secondly, he was the editor of Social Democratic newspaper, and under his influence, I had to be an anti-Nazi and everything what we can do 
I did in order to uh, fight the Nazis. Les provided the underground with all kinds of information about the steelworks, but he and his family didn't stop there. In 1943, they began hiding people who were slated for deportation to Nazi slave labor camps in the small factory his family owned in Budapest. I just tried to open the wall for the purpose to find a pathway to the other part of the factory in case if the people coming in here, they were able to escape because there was an exit from the other way. And suddenly I find the sewer system there. And that's when I thought, okay, that's a great place to put there. Les and his family saved about 200 people by giving them a hiding place. But he took an even greater risk when the OSS approached him. The Office of Strategic Services was the American intelligence agency working behind enemy lines. They recruited Les to pose as a Hungarian Nazi to gather important information. 1943, I was called in to Mr. Schweiker. That's the first time I met him, Julius Schweiker. And uh, uh, he, he says to me, uh, we have an assignment for you. We know do you speak German. And uh, uh, we have a paper here for a G German who came from Romania because Russians came already there. And this guy apparently either died or whatever happened to him. They have all his papers. And he said under his name, would you be willing to take a risk in your life and uh, join the German army? For the next year and a half, Les took the identity of that German, George Namath, serving the Nazis as a liaison between the Hungarian and German Nazi party. His job as an interpreter and driver gave him a lot of freedom of movement. I tried to get this information for them, for instance, from troop movement to uh, orders of deportation and you know, military uh, situation in around Budapest. Since I was in headquarters, I know when they had the deportation orders for the people. And since I was working with the Hungarian Nazis and I was speaking Hungarian and German, they told me they want no paper trail. So everything what we did was verbally. All the orders were verbal. So when I received an order that tomorrow morning a division has to go there, pick up the people in the Budapest ghetto and take it to the railroad station to be deported, I went there and I told them, you don't have to do anything, wait until a further order comes. Les stopped the deportation long enough for some of the Jews to avoid transport. And posing as a Nazi, Les could save people from almost certain death. I have uh, my, my documents which I made up, this, uh, you know, they said that uh, George Namath is uh, an officer of the SS headquarters and everybody should follow his order because his order come from the headquarters and I signed General Wiedemeyer and nobody ever seen his signature so I could have shown that how he do, they wouldn't make any difference, you know. Les used his fake documents many times to help people escape. Sometimes they were people he knew, but usually they were complete strangers. We try to save people, what, whatever you can do. One day I was driving back for an assignment and I see a big crowd and I thought, my God, what the hell are they doing? The group had found a Jew without his yellow star on and was turning him into the Nazis. Quickly thinking, Les pretended to be looking for him, put him in his custody and sent him to freedom. I told him, listen, don't worry. I try to save you. Another time, Les learned that some little Jewish girls were hiding in an orphanage that had been emptied by the Nazis. He found two children seeking shelter inside a piano, put them in his SS car and spirited them to safety. And he helped drive downed American and British fighter pilots to safety, arriving with his German military car in the middle of the night. Drove him down to Chapel Island, to the main street in the front of a church. And the Yugoslav partisans waited for us because they know my car, they know I will deliver it. I drove the car there. Again, I don't talk. I, was, I had order not to talk to anybody and don't ask anybody anything. And these people, they were all civilian clothes already, you know. So what happened, the partisans, whoever they were, 
They opened the back door, took the people out, hit the top of the car, I went back again. He stole official stamps and falsified papers to help people escape. And I stamped it and I signed General Wiedemeyer. This was life and death because of the head of the uh, German occupation force there, General Wiedemeyer, signature was on it with the st official stamp. So this paper saved their lives. Many times you had to do things, you know, on the spur of the moment. You do many times things which you cannot rehearse, to, that don't teach you in West Point or any other place. At the risk of his life and the lives of his family, Les did what he could to stop the Nazi brutality and killings. I did whatever I had to do and help everybody whom I can help. It's very simple. My name is Yolanda Avram Willis. Avram is Abraham in Greek. And uh, I was one of two children, the older uh, by four years from my little brother. We lived in the central part of Greece in the third biggest city called Larissa. And um, my parents were quite comfortable financially. When Yolanda Willis was six and her little brother two, Greece entered World War II on October 28, 1940. The Italian army allies of the Germans invaded from Albania. Six months later, in April, Germany attacked Greece. My father and mother decided to take us away when Germany attacked. And as soon as the invasion or the attack began from the north. Uh, we sped out of Larissa in a hired truck. Yolanda's father tried to spirit away the family, along with several other relatives, to Egypt. They sailed to Crete and waited there for a boat to take them to North Africa. But the Germans invaded Crete and the family was stranded. They met their first rescuers there. A Greek Orthodox family helped them flee to the mountains when the invasion began. We were in the mountains for quite a bit longer than uh, the brief warfare to occupy the island lasted, which was only 10 days. But um, on the 11th day, uh, Crete fell to the Nazis. I think that the people that saved us, they were not the only ones, seemed to have a touch of amazing grace. Um, they not only saved our lives, they preserved our faith in human decency. Yolanda and her family stayed in the foothills of the mountains until they were split up. At that point, we continued to be hidden, uh, just like Anne Frank in her attic, but we were hidden uh, sometimes in the cold communal oven, sometimes in nearby caves, some times in the homes. When things quieted down and the reign of terror was fully established, our friends, our new friends, our rescuers, they sent word that uh, it was safe for us to return, posing as Christians. We came back pretending to be Greek Orthodox like everybody else. Uh, my mother would go with one of the daughters of that family, who was very religious, to the chapel in the center of that little town twice a day, because that's what the daughter did. This particular family further saved us by finding us uh, a captain to take us back to the mainland and having arranged with my father to meet various Greek officials. We had the proper papers, fake papers, to leave the island. On the way back to Greece's mainland, Yolanda's family was stopped by the Germans. They miraculously hid their religion and a few days later were set free, returning to Athens. We were going to stay there with the fake papers and everything. 
awaiting whatever usually happened to Jews in German-occupied places. But, but, but my father and mother had a lot of friends in, throughout Europe, and they had an idea of how it was with the war in other countries. We could not stay in Athens. It was obvious there would be terrible famine. The family decided to return to their home of Larissa. When they got back, they found their property occupied by Italian officers. The family found a small place to live. My family really went into hiding preventively. My parents knew that once the occupation is strictly in the hands of the, the Nazis, it would be just total annihilation. They decided that the only way to save the children was to give them to two different Greek Orthodox families so that if they were caught, the children would have at least a chance of surviving because we were less likely to be noticed. The first person that was able to be given away was me because I was eight years old, a little over eight, and uh, it was easier for a family to say yes than to take in a four-year-old. Yolanda's rescuers were a family of bakers who told the fellow townspeople that she was their baptismal daughter. Her brother was taken in by another kind family. My parents, how could they persuade a family or inspire a family to risk their child's or their children's lives for, uh, for us, or for me, or for my brother. The children were often in danger during raids by Gestapo looking for hidden Jews. One of Yolanda's rescuers ended up hiding too when rumors that he was helping Jews reached the Gestapo. Suddenly, we hear that my father has invited my rescuer, the baker, to come and hide with us because he couldn't go to his home. And now my godfather was a fugitive. So my father, knowing that the man had no other recourse ready, uh, invited him to hide with the hidden Jews. So my godparents became fugitives just like us. And so it came to be that the six-year-old daughter, a Greek Orthodox girl, the baker's daughter became a hidden child like me. Yolanda moved in with a childless couple. Lies and stories had to be told to explain her presence, but fortunately the war was winding down and Yolanda's stay wasn't too long. The war started when I was six, if you recall. I was eight when I went into hiding without my parents and I was 10 when we were liberated. I have had uh, some fear, sometimes unreasonable fear of abandonment. Um, it has taken a lot of work to overcome uh, part of these experiences. Um, we were very fortunate that we met with such fantastic, generous, courageous people these angels, really. But there are still scars. Most people know the story of Oskar Schindler, the German industrialist who saved 1,200 Jews by employing them to work in his factory in Krakow, Poland, saving them from certain death. Or they've heard of Raoul Wallenberg, the Swedish diplomat posted in Hungary who issued protective passports to tens of thousands of Jews in 1944. But few know the story of a Chinese diplomat who helped thousands of Jews flee Austria between 1938 and 1940. My English name is Betty Carlson. I have a Chinese name, which is Pei Wen Ho. And my grandfather is Feng Shan Ho, who was the Chinese ambassador to Vienna, Austria 
until Anschluss, and then he became the head of the consulate. The story of Feng Shano begins in the Hunan province of China. Born in 1901 to a poor family, he was intelligent and ambitious, educated by Methodist missionaries. He left Hunan to enter university. He also did his doctoral work in Europe, so he spoke German fluently. Actually, he spoke several languages fluently, but he did enter you know, diplomatic service for China, and China at the time actually had diplomatic ties with Germany and Austria. Ho was posted to Vienna shortly after the Nazis annexed Austria in March 1938. That became known as the Anschluss. This is my grandfather presenting his credentials to the Austrian Senate. The Jewish population was immediately terrorized by the Nazis and most wanted to leave Austria. But restrictive immigration policies all over the world offered few countries where the Jews could seek refuge. Ho was moved to help. No one in the family knew, but after he had passed away, it was discovered by a man in San Francisco, as a matter of fact. Um, that he apparently had issued visas to Austrian Jews, Chinese visas, realizing that most people were not going to immigrate to China, but realizing that they needed visas so that they could exit Nazi Germany. The Nazis required that Jews have entry visas in order to escape Austria. For the persecuted Jews, it meant life, and Ho must have realized this because in 1938, he began issuing visas to all who requested them. The numbers he issued soon grew. It was at least several hundred a month, which is well over quota, and so if you figure he started issuing them after Anschluss, and then he was evicted from the consulate in 1940 within a period of maybe 18 months, several hundred a month. From one of the survivors that I did meet, I heard that people lined up and they ate, slept, and dreamt visas, and all they heard or thought about were visas, and which embassy should we line up today in front of, and, and who did you think would give you a better chance of a visa? Feng Shan Ho offered hope. One of the survivor stories that we have who received visas from China uh, was a, f a fellow who said that he was, lying, he was in line in front of the Chinese embassy when he saw my grandfather's car um, approaching the embassy and the window was cracked a little bit and, and you know the windows are tinted and he wasn't even sure my grandfather was inside he, he took a chance, he took all of his family's papers and paperwork and, and he thrust them all through the window on the chance that was actually my grandfather inside. And three days later, he got a notification from the embassy to come pick up his visas. The Chinese government was not happy with Ho. They had ties to Nazi Germany and saw Ho's actions as endangering their diplomatic relations. They forbade him from issuing the visas on such a vast scale. His ambassador in Berlin got a lot of flack for it and sent someone to Vienna to see if, in fact, he was selling visas. My grandfather replied to this fellow, why should I be selling something that could be had for free? He was later uh, you know, fired from his position in Vienna. He was sent away from that position because he was well over quota. After Betty's grandfather died in 1997, stories about the people he saved began reaching the family, including Betty's aunt, Man Lee. Someone came forward and said to her, you know, you should know what your father did for us and came forth with a story that he had written 20 visas for this man's family 
so that they could leave Austria. And so uh, I believe she included it in my grandfather's obituary. We met Johnny Moser, whose family uh, received visas from my grandfather. I just get goosebumps because he spoke to me as if he were getting on a bus going downtown. He said, you know, I was on a transport to Dachau and my sister and mother were able to get these visas for the family. So they came and got me. I got off the transport and so here I am. I don't even think we still know the entire story. There are still people coming forth. Um, I mean, as recently as two years ago, I met a survivor in Washington, D.C. His family had received um, visas from my grandfather. As the story of Feng Shan Ho has become more public, his actions are finally being recognized. In 2000, Yad Vashem, Israel's Holocaust Museum and Research Center, gave him the title of righteous among the nations. The government of the People's Republic of China was there, and they had survivors who had actually received visas from my grandfather there. This is the, um, the certificate of honor from the Yad Vashem um, that my dad brought back. It has the quote, he who saves one life. It's as if he had saved the entire world. Ho has been honored by the U.S. Senate too. There was an exhibit in the rotunda of the Senate we were invited to uh, also. And finally, the Chinese government itself honored Ho. The government of China and the government of Israel decided to celebrate my grandfather uh, on what would have been his 100th birthday in his hometown. And they had a huge exhibit, and, um, and we went to China. It was really a once-in-a-lifetime trip. Why did Ho risk his diplomatic career and possibly his life to save so many people? He did it because of who he is. If he were alive today, I think he would have been very surprised at the fuss that people are making about it, or that he would have been rewarded for it. September 1st was a very, very bad day. The Germans drove into ghetto. They surrounded our three hospitals. We had a general hospital, children's hospital, and hospital for contagious disease. They took out all the patients, put them on trucks, and drove them out of ghetto for extermination. And then they announced that all children and all old people will be deported. Irene first is remembering that awful day in 1942 when the Germans came into the Lodz ghetto and began emptying it of the Jews. On that day, 25,000 people were taken out for extermination, but Irene's long journey didn't begin or end on September 1st, 1942. It all began in the Polish city of Lodz. It was an industrial city. It had a population of, the, of about three quarter million people of one third were Jews. My parents were middle class, I would say rather well to do. They owned a ladies wear store. I had one sister who was five years younger, but I had a large extended family. When Germany invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939, the life Irene and her family knew came to an abrupt halt when discriminatory laws against Jews were enacted. The, the Nuremberg laws against the Jews went to effect right away. Jews were not allowed to own businesses, which meant that my parents had to give up their store. Jews were not allowed to employ 
non-Jews. So the maid, the Polish maid, who lived with us for as long as I could remember, had to leave. Jews were ordered to turn over all their valuables to the Germans. Jews were not allowed to worship. The uh, synagogues were destroyed. By January 1940, life changed. All Jews were ordered to live together in an assigned territory, a Jewish ghetto. Lodge Ghetto was the first ghetto to be established and the last one to be dissolved. Now, when we went into ghetto, we had to register. And it was established that there were about 160,000 Jews when ghetto closed. It was a small town. And we had our own administration, Jewish police, Jewish fire department, even jail. We had hospitals. The Jewish head of ghetto was the famous or infamous Chaim Rumkowski. He was called the Juden Elteste, which means the eldest of Jews appointed by the Germans. And slowly, ghetto organized. We always had cold winters in Poland, in Lodz, but it seemed to us that the winters of 1940 and 1941 were the coldest in our memory. And we had nothing to warm up the apartments with. You see, we were completely dependent on the Germans. They were food distributing places and food was rationed. They faced hunger daily, but also the threat of deportation. The Germans would demand Jews, and Romkowski would deliver them, 5,000, 10,000, whatever they asked. He did follow their orders, but truthfully, if he didn't, they would have found out somebody else who did. Every Jew was ordered to work. Factories were set up to provide goods for the Germans. I had the best job in ghetto. Hospitals were warm and hospitals had food. Irene stayed there until the Nazis emptied all hospitals in September 1942. And more and more people continued to die throughout the ghetto, including Irene's beloved grandmother and then her mother. In um, spring 1944, we were told that ghetto will be liquidated. Now, why was ghetto being liquidated? because the Soviet army was already nearing Warsaw. It is summer 1944. I left with my father and my sister on August 26. We were taken by a train and squeezed in it took hours and hours and hours, and our destination was Auschwitz. When we arrived in Auschwitz, we were told to disembark, and we were met by tall assessmen, each one was a German shepherd next to him. Then the Germans ordered for men and women to separate. I said goodbye to my father, and that was the last time I have seen my father. Anybody who looked too young or too old was taken away. My sister started to cry, and I took her hand, and I said to her, whatever happens, we are together. I said, just hold on to me. We were shaved. We were told that we were given a shower. Now, I learned later that the people who were guests also were told that they will take a shower. But instead of water, guests came from the pipes.
but the water came down on us. Five days later, Irene and her sister were sent to a work camp in Stutthof on the Baltic Sea. It was a perilous life for the prisoners. We were about 1,600 people in a barrack that could probably accommodate five or 600. So pretty soon we were covered with lice. And what did the lice bring with it? Brought typhus. And one after another, we got sick. Our people were dying like flies. When I told you uh, that my sister saved me, I remember that even so I survived the fever, I was so sick and uh, so weak that all I wanted was to go to sleep and never get up. And then one evening I heard somebody calling out, please somebody help me, I'm so thirsty, please somebody help me. And I realized that it was my sister's voice. I took care of her, but I couldn't save her. But I always feel that she saved me. Irene survived Stutthof, survived a death march, survived in humane conditions. She was liberated in the spring of 1945. My story is really an unbelievable. You have a ghetto, you have Auschwitz. From my experience, I know that in the dehumanized conditions that the Germans exposed us to, we had to remain humane and help each other. And that's the way I survived, because I helped others and others helped me. So why should we study the Holocaust? Why should we pay attention to it? Aren't there other atrocities that are more recent that are within our, our memory? Um, the Holocaust is the most significant atrocity of the 20th century. And it par it's a paradigm for others. So therefore, it's worth investigating for a number of reasons. As people who live in Western culture and Western society, it is something that we have to investigate and examine on our own because it's us. It took place in Europe, in a highly technological, scientifically oriented society that saw itself really in the cutting edge of research, medical, sociological, psychological, artistic. And the Holocaust is, has specific meaning for Jews, but it also includes others. The Nazis' first victims were, in fact, not Jews. In 1939, they went to mental institutions, jails, and infant wards and murdered those Germans they found to be unwanted and undesirable. These were people that carried genetic flaws as far as they were concerned, and they did not want them procreating. They did not want these people having children that would pollute the Aryan bloodlines. In the same way that Jews were seen as outside destroyers, these were the inside destroyers. Over 70,000 Germans were killed between 1939 and 1941 as part of this so-called positive eugenics program. By the end of the war, 200,000 German nationals and Austrians with physical and mental disabilities and genetic diseases were murdered by the Nazis. The Nazis built six death factories, Auschwitz, Treblinka, Maidanek, Sobibor, Chelmno, and Belzec. They established a system of impersonal technological mass murder to replace the Einsatzgruppen men who had to kill each person with a bullet. In a wartime period, that's a huge expense. You're saving your bullets to shoot at other people who can shoot back at you. There's a second expense as well, that when they began to look at the Einsatzgruppen men who actually did the shooting, they saw them being desensitized, that they were systematically killing people and the light had gone out from their eyes. So they had to find an impersonal manner of killing large numbers of people that would not involve any kind of human contact with these people. The Jews were not the only victims of the death factories. The Nazis killed several hundred thousand gypsies and thousands of homosexuals, Jehovah's Witnesses, Poles, political opponents, and prisoners of war. When the Nazis wanted to test the gassing facilities of Auschwitz, they tested them on Soviet POWs. Again, life not worth living. They discarded huge numbers of people as just being not human or not having human characteristics, or as one text said, 
These are animals in human form. So we have to pay attention to this whole theme of racism. Racism dehumanizes. Racism stereotypes. Racism robs individuals of those things which take us and bring us together. This is central to the whole Nazi ideology. And Hitler came to power because of the people through the ballot box. People voted him into office. We have to pay attention as voters, as citizens, the people who run for office in our communities. We have to pay attention to what they say. We have to take them seriously. Because we see in the case of the Holocaust that political rhetoric leads to an end that is deadly for millions of people. According to Holocaust scholar Raoul Hilberg, there are three people that emerged from the Holocaust. There are perpetrators, there are victims, and there are bystanders. Hopefully, none of us will ever be victims. Hopefully, none of us will ever be perpetrators, which means that we are all bystanders. So therefore, we study the Holocaust and know how to behave as bystanders. We know we should know what to do. Let me conclude by quoting Martin Niemöller. Niemöller was a Lutheran pastor who belonged to a group of ministers who were opposed to the Nuremberg legislation of 1935. Lee Muller survived the war, and he's quoted as having said afterwards, first they came for the communists, but since I wasn't a communist, I didn't do anything. Then they came for the liberals, but I wasn't a liberal, so I didn't do anything. They came for the Jews, and certainly I wasn't a Jew, so I didn't do anything. But when they came for me, there was no one to stand up with me. Studying the Holocaust means that we have to gather together, we have to coalesce in order to oppose radical evil. Nazism is radical evil. Radical evil did not die with the Nazis. It's still there. It's still within the hearts of some of us, some of those who are around us. We have to stand up against it. That's the lesson of the Holocaust.